Hi everybody, thanks for watching. I'd like to talk about something I had my eye on for the last couple of years and I just couldn't justify the, the cost of buying one. And I'm still not sure if I can justify it, but I'm a little bit happier because I'm paying about half the price I would normally had to. And uh, they came up on eBay for about $258. Buy it now, ship to your door. And I decided with as many as were available out there, there wasn't that many. And I wasn't sure if more were coming available. I decided to get two of them. So here they are. We'll take a look. Uh, what they are and see what kind of damage they have happened in transit from from none other than our favorite economical place to buy stuff China no less so as you may have guessed it's none other than a diesel engine this is a 168 F model I'm not sure exactly who makes it I'm a little disappointed that the manual is completely in Chinese, except for the numbers. Apparently numbers, Chinese numbers and English numbers are, are the same. Although, there's also some formulas in here that apparently use English letters too, which I thought was a little... Uh, now I can't find them. Yeah. I'd have to study this a little more, but I'm not exactly sure what they're what they're trying to get at mathematically, but I'm surprised that they use English letters in these formulas. And I'm a little disappointed that it doesn't have any torque or power curves in here because it would be interesting to to know what the torque is on this. They do give the rated power. Here's your engine horsepower. This is the, the model we have, a 186F, so it's looking at about 3 PS. A PS is a little bit less than a, a horsepower, so just under 3 horsepower at 3000 RPM. So that's good to know. So we can back calculate the torque by dividing the power by the speed and that would give us a, a torque that we'd have to convert over to pound-feet of torque or foot-pounds whatever your or newton meters or whatever your units of measure that you like so we get that much out of there the weight of it I think it's listed in here too it's about 20 kilograms so probably one of the lightest diesels you're gonna find the next size up is 23, and after that they're 30, so about 30% less than the, than the higher end, uh, higher horsepower models here, the equivalent five, four or five horsepower models. So that's nice. So that kind of gets it into the, the weight of something that's a little more manageable. I'm not going to be able to build a chainsaw out of it, but I can at least fit it in some other applications where the bigger engines just won't fit. Let's go ahead and pull this out of here and see what what sort of damage there is, if any. Hopefully not much. A lot of styrofoam particles running around, and it looks like the package took a pretty good beating on the way over here. So even though it's one of the smallest diesels, it certainly isn't tiny by any means, certainly compared to a gasoline engine of the same of the same power. And this is interesting that it has 4.0 on there, because that would tend to indicate either 4 PS or 4 horsepower, which is pretty close to the same thing. And that's actually a 170 FA, so I wonder if this is not even a 168 F. So let's see if we can figure that out. Looks like the fuel tank might have had a little bend in the top, which 
doesn't surprise me. Uh, air filter is a little loose on here, but it does tighten up, so that's good. Or Chinese writing, that's not going to help me with whatever they're trying to communicate. So let's see if we can identify if this is actually, well, this doesn't look good. But it may be okay. Let's see. Okay. Ah, uh, I don't know. I might have to. Looks like this got bent. So we'll have to bend that back. I'll check the other one just to see or look at the pictures online and see what what this is supposed to be like. But that looks like it's not correct and bent. Although it may may actually still work. One of the first things I'm always interested in is getting my hands on the owner's manual. Thankfully, these engines come with a manual. Unfortunately, it is almost entirely, or it is entirely in Chinese. And if you don't know Chinese, you're going to have a hard time understanding what's really being said. Of course, there are some things you can make out on the specifications page. There's some things you can kind of infer in terms of, there's the model number, of course, we knew that when we bought it, not sure what that says. Bore time stroke, 196 cc or 0.196 liters, revolutions per minute is 3000 RPM. And at that it should be generating 2.2 kilowatts or around 3 PS, which is a roughly three horsepower for the 168. Uh, I'm not sure what that is. This I'm guessing is injection pressure, timing, uh, possibly fuel here, and type of oil. So I'm always curious that the Chinese have all these symbols for their alphabet, but yet the number system is, is the same across the world, which is very helpful, but it also is pretty interesting. So when it gets into units, like for millimeters here, that's it's kind of interesting to note why is that always universal? Why, why isn't that written in Chinese? So some of the things you just kind of wonder about this stuff. Um, give you some dimensions of the engine. Again, some more some more specs, which I'm not really sure off the top of my head. Uh, more more literature, mostly indecipherable. It tells you how to start the engine with the pictorial diagrams, which is nice. And it's also interesting how they convey that information. So they show a bowl here, actually pulling back so that like, apparently when you get to the compression stroke that's supposed to be the bowl pulling back on the rope and keep that in mind another diagram of starting more literature but there's something that can help you with this and Google among others makes a neat little program called Google Translate that actually will help you in real time read this so you can download this for your app and it has a camera function that allows you to translate languages in real time and so it's kind of fun to play with and it's also kind of interesting to see what it shows if you let it go so it's health instructions I saw user's manual, air-cooled diesel engine. I think user's manuals make weekly instructions. So in addition to learning how the manual works, it also gives you some pointers as to how to run your life. So we'll take that to be user's manual, air-cooled diesel engine. And what else?
else is it interpreting here? Air cooled dual machine, air cooled chai juice machine, maybe. So you can have some fun with that. Let's look at the specifications page and see what we can figure out about this motor. Main technical site, main technical specifications. So type, single cylinder, four stroke swirl chamber type, including horizontal type forced air cooling. So it is a swirl chamber and not direct inject not direct injection, which is a little disappointing. Which means it's going to be a little bit harder to start. Being a swirl chamber, it would be nice if they had made a provision for a glow plug or some sort of heating, but I didn't see one on there. Uh, what else does it say? Rated speed, power, output shaft, counterclockwise, which is standard looking at it. Yeah, injection pressures, 14 plus or minus a half of megapascal. Now to get the air out of the lines of the injection system, what you want to do is open up this banjo bolt until you have all the air bubbles that you can get out of there. Once this pump has fuel, it's going to drive it into the injector line. A lot of people think you got to take and loosen these injector nuts to purge this line, but this just it's not true, you don't have to. It doesn't hurt anything, it, it can help. But once this pump, being a positive displacement pump, has fuel, it will push it into that line. And I'll go ahead and show you that because actually the way they have this set up here, you, you can hardly, hardly even get a wrench in there. The exhaust is kind of in the way from allowing you to turn it. So you have to take these flange bolts and loose, at least loosen them up to give yourself a little more room. There is some fuel in the line, probably from when they were test running it. We'll make sure we get that all out of there. And again, normally I wouldn't do this. I'm just showing you that you don't have to open these lines and purge it, purge out the injector line to have this work. Make sure all the fuel is out of here. We'll actually blow it out. There's a little bit in there, we'll blow it out from both directions. Now we know we just have air in the line. We'll hook that back up. These are 17 millimeter nuts. In case you were wondering. It's pretty standard for most injection systems I've ever worked on. Get the exhaust flange tightened up again.
the bleed line on the pump is actually an 18 millimeter and you'll just want to open that and make sure you got a nice solid stream of fuel coming out with no air bubbles once you have that nice solid stream coming out there no air bubbles go ahead and tighten everything back up and at this point you have fuel to the pump and that's all you need to get it to the injector then you want to set your rack or your speed governor spring to the full speed position just to make sure you're getting as much fuel as the pump can put out through the injector line and from my experience you want to you want to give about seven pulls is when it will start getting fuel and just hold the compression release or the exhaust valve open just so you're not pulling against compression and just slowly pull it about seven times Now we should have fuel to the injector. I'm gonna back off on the speed here a little bit just so it doesn't go right up to full speed right away. Don't have to do that, it's just something I prefer. should be good to go as long as you never run it out of fuel you won't have to purge it anymore but as you can see it's not that hard Again, just this banjo bolt if you ever do run it out open it up till the bubbles are gone tighten it up pull it a few times and you should be back up and running So it looks like no matter what speed it's being run at, it's rated around sitting between 95 and 105 decibels. Definitely not something that will qualify for a quiet engine on a generator set. What sort of 
options do I have in cold weather for getting this going? And as you know, in North America, even as south, far south as Texas, you're going to see some cold weather where maybe you might have to use it. And then what are you going to do? There's no, absolutely no provision on here for cold weather starting. You don't even have an electric starter to hook to to help you out on those days when it's cold. And we all know if you if you have any experience with diesel, enough cranking on it will build enough heat in the cylinder and the cylinder head to eventually have it fired off if you can keep your starter from burning up and you have enough batteries to keep feeding it. In this case we just have a pole starter and from my experience once temperatures drop below 30 degrees it's going to take a lot of pulling if ever to get it started. We're going to look at what other options we have to help you out on those cold days to keep you up and running and hopefully make this engine reliable even when the weather is cold in your area. I've laid out some of the starting aids I've used over the years or have considered using. On the left, more convenient, easier to use, um, and as you go to the right, a little more hassle, less convenient. On the left, it's good old ether. And I don't know, there's not much to say about that. Works great. I haven't seen a time where it was too cold for that to actually work. If you don't have that, but you do have a 120 volt power supply, you can consider using old fashioned hair dryer. This particular one puts out about 1850 watts, which is quite a bit of heat and enough to help that out tremendously. Next down the list here are grid heaters which is essentially just like a hair dryer except it doesn't have a fan on it and they work at lower voltages DC versus AC these two are set up for DC this particular one's 12 volt and this one's for 24 volt this one came off of a air-cooled Yanmar one cylinder diesel so this would probably be your best bet for an engine this size which you'd have to adapt to the intake and mount it in there and then you'd also have to still have a 12 volt power supply which could be inconvenient. This is a grid heater out of a Cummins engine probably a 5.9. I'm not sure if the 6.7s use this same size they may be bigger I'm not that familiar with them but these are pretty good high wattage I think this is like 2400 watts but it's set up for 24 volts. They actually have two grids in them in series which means you could go across just one grid and use one under 12 volts or hook 12 volts to these in parallel and get double the amount of heat. But you're going to use double the amount of amps as well. This is something I haven't tried yet but I've came across recently I thought was kind of neat is this heat tape, 12 volt heat tape. And this comes in various wattages and lengths and thicknesses. I picked out one that's 12 volt, 150 watt, mainly because on the trailer connection to the truck I have, it supposedly puts out 18 amps at 12 volts, which is a little over 200 watts, and I thought that would be an option when this motor is used on a trailer on the winch. You could just plug it in as you're traveling down the road, or just sitting for that matter, and apply some heat to the engine to start warming it up. You roll that tape out, and you can wrap it around the cylinder head or the cylinder area, put a blanket over it just to help keep that heat in there. And last, if you, none of these other things are available, I'll show you what I like to call improvised thermal start, which is based around the thermal starts I've seen on the Perkins engines. Those have a heating element that heats up and then lets some diesel fuel in and ignites that and gets that intake warmed up. So I'll show you, so that's an option you can use. Like I said, a little less convenient, something that would I would not recommend you do on a regular basis, but in a pinch it could help you out if you find yourself in that situation. You gotta get a diesel going. We'll take a look at that. There are also other things that I don't have here that could be an option too. There are magnetic oil pan heaters I've seen, different wattages and, and voltage rating, ratings that you can use. Unfortunately, this 
crankcase material is either aluminum or magnesium, I believe, or some other non-ferrous metal, so you're not going to be able to attach a magnetized heater to it. But you could find other ways of attaching it and get kind of the same result as this heat tape, which I imagine the heat tape and the oil pan heaters are very similar in construction. I've never owned one, so I don't know. So let's take a look at some of these and see how they can work and it will give you an idea what to expect on some of those colder days when you can't get that diesel going just by pull start alone. We're just under 10 degrees on the head. Exhaust is showing about 12 degrees Fahrenheit. First attempt. The starting fluid directly in the air cleaner. The spring return on the rack setting is about half. Let's go ahead and get the engine to where we're in compression stroke. Set the compression release. All right, and it's kind of difficult to get ether up there. And let's go ahead and get our baseline temperature here just to show you that we are starting with a cold engine. And hopefully you can see that it's 13.1 degrees right where the injector goes into the head. 13, 14. Exhaust temperature is right around 14 as well. So definitely a cold engine. One thing you want to do before you start putting heat on here is remove any elements that are vulnerable to heat damage your air filter element in there. It, it probably would be okay, you could probably heat it, but we're not gonna take our chances here because I don't have spares. This being from China, I don't have a lot of spare parts for it in terms of filters and things like that. So we're gonna go ahead and take those things out of here, including the gasket that's underneath the air filter. And then at that point, we'll just be heating steel components, which are certainly capable of taking the heat. And we'll start out with about 30 seconds of heat time. And then continue to add heat as we try and start it. And we'll see how much that can help us. All right, go ahead and put it on high, point it into the intake. And let's start for about 30 seconds.
So we're coming up upon 30 seconds. It's putting out good heat. One thing we want to do is probably keep it more like that if you want to step back over there so I can work the pole starter. Keep as much heat as we can, as close as we can going into the intake. Keep your vents open so that you allow air circulation to go into the motor, into the intake. And let's start pulling. So we got the speed setting set about half. We got heat going in. Let's see if that will help us out and how many pulls it's going to take to get us going. That actually worked a little bit better than I was thinking it would. So there's another option for you if you have access to 110 power and about 30 seconds worth. You could even get yourself an inverter running off a battery for about that amount of time. And just allows another, another option to get you going when the temperatures are cold. We're sitting around 14 to 15 degrees Fahrenheit question may come up, what happens if you have a diesel that doesn't have any cold start provisions such as a glow plug or intake heater and you don't have any ether handy, what other options do you have? This particular engine gives us the ability do what I like to call an improvised thermal start because its intake is constructed of steel and this allows us to actually get to the point where we can try another technique that most people probably don't bother doing or unaware of and in order to do this we want to remove any elements that could be subjective to damage by adding heat so we we'll want to remove that air filter element And try and keep all the pieces in here so we don't lose them. We can put them back later. In this particular engine, we also have a rubber gasket on the bottom. We want to get rid of that. At this point, you could actually use this technique right with the air cleaner housing the way it is. Because I don't want to damage the paint, I actually am using a bearing cap from a trailer it just happens to fit very nicely and in addition it has an area that will hold a liquid level in there put that in there so it's fairly secure and then what we're going to need to do is add a little bit of diesel fuel in that ring and if you don't want to get your hands full of diesel fuel you can use the return line from the from the injector pump and you don't need very much in fact if your engine's been running long enough and the return lines full of diesel you can just bleed a little bit of that off of there you'll be surprised at how little it takes and how long a burn will last just with a few drops of diesel fuel the other thing you're going to need is an ignition source I happen to have a lighter here 
This is just a butane lighter. Ideally, I'd be able to light this off just directly with a butane lighter, but at 12 degrees or whatever we're sitting at, somewhere between 12 and 20 degrees Fahrenheit. It's just not warm enough to directly light the diesel with the butane lighter, and I'll show you that. And if you sit here long enough, you might be able to get the diesel to go, but I learned in my experience that it takes a lot longer than you might have patience for. And some of this comes down to the flash point and fire point and auto ignition temperatures of the different fuels. While diesel has a lower auto ignition point, somewhere around 400 to 450 degrees, the flash point is well above 100 degrees Fahrenheit, which essentially means you have to get this container or whatever you have up to 100 degrees before the diesel begins to vaporize enough to continue to burn. And as you can imagine, in these lower temperatures, that becomes a problem. Whereas with gasoline, gasoline has a much lower flash point, somewhere around 40 to 50 below Fahrenheit. Therefore, it allows a ignition to occur at a much lower temperature. Then you might ask yourself, well, why don't you just pour gasoline directly in there and act, have it act like ether? The problem is, although gasoline has a lower flash point, its auto ignition temperature is actually much higher than diesel. And just to throw some numbers out there, ether has a auto ignition temperature of around 320 degrees Fahrenheit. Diesel is around 400 to 450, and then gasoline is somewhere around 500 to 550. What that means is, is until you get the temperature above 500 degrees or 550 degrees for gasoline, it's not, it's not going to continue to burn. And that's why we run into some of these problems with the diesel, trying to get it going at these lower temperatures. So we put enough in there to get a little bit of a burn, and again, you'll be surprised how long that will burn with just a very little amount, I would say a quarter to a half a teaspoon of diesel. And then we want to add a little bit of gasoline. Probably again another half a teaspoon or so, that's all it takes. And depending on the temperature and conditions, you may need to light it a couple different times. We'll go ahead and see where we're at here. I notice we do have a little bit of leakage down into the container here, so we're going to get a little bit of a burn into the holder. And that's one reason you want to make sure that the air cleaner is not plastic, because it is subject to the higher temperatures at the flames that we're going to get here. So keep that in mind as you're doing this. All right, and at this point, you, you got a fair amount of time. Let things heat up a little bit. Set your fuel setting to about half speed or so if you haven't done it already. And at 20 degrees, without any additional heat, you're just going to have a really tough time getting this thing to start. Eventually enough pulling may do it. But any sort of heat can really help you out a lot. So let's give this a try and see what happens. <laughs> 